Think about the mood swings Joseph must have experienced as his dream world was plunged into one nightmare after another. He went from the place of privilege at his father's side to captivity in a dirty hole in the ground. He went from that dirty hole in the ground to a slave auction block in Egypt. He went from the slave block to a position as overseer in the home of Potiphar. He went from being Potiphar's trusted overseer to being an accused sex criminal in prison. Talk about mood swings. Few have ever been catapulted from privilege to prison and back with such frequency. What a story. A grieving father, perplexed brothers, and a humble 17-year-old on his way to slavery in the country of the Nile. And yet, the Bible tells us on several occasions, the Lord was with Joseph. What makes his story so remarkable? Even though he knew the heartache of the abandoned, he trusted the Lord. Chapter 39 is where we are at. We're starting in verse two. I'll read verse one. It says, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard in Egypt, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. In case you don't have your Bible open. So the scriptures on the back of the handout, but you probably want your own Bible open so we can get some commentary. There are lots of themes in this passage. And uh, in my search for a song, I did actually search. I just thought of the childhood songs we sang about yielding, <coughs> not, not yielding to temptation. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward. Man Can you say manfully these days? Fight manfully onward. Dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. The one I chose to go with the session is number 639. It says, Father, lead me day by day, ever in thine own sweet way. Teach me to be pure and true. Show me what I ought to do. Verse 2 says, when in danger, make me brave. Make me know that thou canst save. Keep me safe by thy dear side. Let me in thy love abide. Linda's not here, right? I didn't capitalize the T, so hopefully. When I'm tempted to do wrong, make me steadfast, wise, and strong. And when all alone I stand, Shield me with thy mighty hand. Think of this 17 year old kid. Think of the circumstances that has befallen him at this early age. Think of how he goes from the favor of his father. I almost want to say arrogance, but it's just confidence. You know, hey, dad loves me, give me this code, and I have these dreams, and I'm telling you that this is what it says. And then the hating starts from his brothers, and we are now in Egypt. So that's where we are. Verse one, as I read it, said that he is sold to the captain of the guard. And that's where we're going to pick up. So we're going to read, it's a long passage, I know that, Genesis 39, 2 through 21, after we pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do love you and we deeply appreciate the chance to sit around these tables and break bread. We pray that you'll be in our conversation, that we leave with a sense renewed to serve you, understanding that circumstances come in our lives that we do not fully appreciate sometimes, but that when you are with us, we need not worry, we need not fear. We need to just accept that your guiding hand is taking us where we need to be, even through difficulties. So we thank you for the difficulties and the challenges that come, knowing that you will see us through. Bless our time together, and may we leave saying it was good that we came today. In Jesus' name. We're reading Genesis 39, starting at verse 2. So you kind of know a little bit of what's going on. Not a good situation for a 17 year old, maybe 20 year old by now. One of the verses in there, now there's some scholars who <coughs> ask the question who knew? Joseph was the only one in Egypt, the only Hebrew in Egypt. So the details had to come from Joseph. And there's some scholars who say that Joseph wrote the account and it got passed on. Except for this one phrase in the second paragraph on the hand that I give you. It says, now Joseph was well built and handsome. Yeah. And that made me think, well, Joseph didn't write this, did he? <laughs> because, um, well, you know, I'm not so bad looking. Not me, I'm saying. 
So I'm saying, oh, it doesn't really matter, but anyway, I'm glad your dad is here to hear this. <laughs> Question number one. With you. How did Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob, come to be a slave in an Egyptian household? Last week. His brothers sold him to slavery. His brothers who wanted to kill him eventually sold him to slavery. His loving, loyal brothers. Question number two takes us to the first verse on our handout, verse two. According to verse two, how did being sold into slavery affect his relationship with God? Made it stronger. Does anyone have any commentary on verse two? If you don't have any, I'm going to read mine. Or maybe why you look at you. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. This key phrase of the section is repeated in verse 21 and verse 23. The Lord was with Joseph. It indicates that God cared for, protected, and blessed Joseph. Joseph occupied a very high station for a slave. He lived and worked in the master's house. Any other comments or commentary? Yes. Um, it says Joseph's life in Egypt is overwhelmed by God's providential care. Takes me to last night to uh, one of the band members. Overwhelmed. And I love that, that song by that. Overwhelmed by God's providential care. It's an interesting word. Overwhelmed. I guess I've been overwhelmed by somebody's kindness in the past, so I guess I don't understand it. Any other comments related to this question? Otherwise, we'll keep moving. We have a long way to go. Verse three, question number three. Verse three says his master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with Joseph and put him in charge of his household. And I asked, how does Potiphar, an Egyptian, who may be serving some Egyptian God, see that God is with Joseph. And what may he have seen? A little bit of speculation is not bad right now. What may he have seen? But scriptures to say he saw that God was with Joseph. How he acted, how he worked, how uh, someone lived his life. Okay. Can I summarize that with his witness? Any other thoughts? It must have been different from the other uh, employees or staff. Slaves. Slaves. Yeah. What she said. It was different. It could be an attitude. It could be a demeanor. We're already told that he is well built and handsome. Okay. Very bad. Very bad. <laughs> but he saw this guy had a good attitude. Despite the circumstances, remember, he's still a slave. He had a good attitude, despite the circumstances. Any takeaways right now? Let's see if we can apply that. It just says he prospered and, and, must, and that the Lord was with him. So there was some supernatural kind of prospering going on here that caught Potiphar's attention to the point made earlier. It was very different from what he had seen. I'm thinking of a song. <laughs> if crosses come, oh. I'll not turn back. Anyone help me out here? Not the number, the words. <laughs> I want to read it. 649. If crosses come, it should cost me dearly to be the servant of my servant Lord. If darkness falls around the path of duty, and men despise the savior I've adored, I'll not turn back. Whatever it may cost, I'm called to live, to love, and save the lost. If doors should close, then other doors will open. The word of God can never be contained. His love cannot be finally frustrated by narrow minds or prison bars restrained. If tears should fall, if I'm called to suffer, if all I love, men should deface, defame, I'll not deny the one that I have followed, nor be ashamed to bear my master's name. 
Oh, no, it turned back. Part of the lamp. Part of the lamp. Oh, the the musical. Yeah. Uh, I'm not that old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I'm going to do penance. Catholic for a minute here. <laughs> okay. Moving along. Thank you. Now we get to verse seven. Question number four. Why do you suppose the phrase Joseph was well built and handsome was included in this story? I had my son. I think it shows why she was attracted to him. Yeah. Right. Simple answer. He was yeah. blessed by God. So maybe included. Yes. Remember, this kid was. Favored by his father. So it might have been something that was said yesterday. Yeah. A mama's boy. <laughs> but you know, my, my commentary says uh, this echoes uh, 29.17 describing Joseph's mother, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he must have taken after his mother. His good looks. I thought that too. He's got his good looks from his mother. <laughs> he, was, he was like the best of the best. And yes. besides, when a woman is turned down, there's no wrath that equals women's scorn. That's what I know. Shakespeare. Have <laughs> no fury. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that almost didn't make it into the list of questions today. Question number five. Remember back in Genesis 2 and 3, Adam and Eve being tempted? Yes. Contrast Joseph's response to temptation with Adam and Eve's responses in Genesis 2 and 3. What were the consequences in these two situations? He said no, 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 just one time. Right, he did consider. Away, he didn't stay away because he knew she was. Well, she said he, it sounds like he didn't consider, but he did consider. Like Adam and God told Adam and Eve they could have anything in the garden except. Mm -hmm. right. He's saying, Master has let me have anything in the. That's but except you. Adam and Eve didn't take any responsibility for what they had done. Here, Joseph is taking some personal responsibility because he knows who he is. He knows who his father is, who mm -hmm. his family is. Mm -hmm. He takes responsibility. Yes. <clears throat> consequences, part B of the question. What were the consequences in these two situations? Quite similar. Cast out. Say that one more time, please. Cast out. Cast out. I mean, they were cast out of the garden, and he was cast out of the palace. Okay. I wasn't that far advanced, but I like that. <laughs> Consequences. I'm thinking in terms of him not yielding, you know? Mm. And he also cast himself out by running. Right. Flee youthful lusts, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy. Flee youthful lusts. And uh, I think because he was young, one of your sermons you talked about, Rich Young Ruler, a proposition that you couldn't understand how it could be avoided. Rich, young, and handsome. You added the handsome part. But here we are told that he was handsome and well built and very responsible. Yield not to temptation is the song I think I started with, for yielding is sin. And he did not yield. He ran as far as he could. A good lesson. When temptation comes my way, what's the next line to that? We don't have a songbook memorized. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my memory started to fail me. All right, question number six. Let's keep moving. Verse 10. Verse 10 indicates that Potiphar's wife was relentless. Let's read verse 10 one more time. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, all right, she was relentless in her pursuit of Joseph. In what ways can a temptation become 
seemingly relentless. Let's talk about our own reality now. In what ways by the temptation? Have you ever been tempted? Don't answer. Have you ever been tempted relentlessly? Have you ever felt like, okay, this thing is not going away and I need some help of some kind? Well, that's what's stopping us. Like people who want something very badly, mm -hmm. they will continually get in your face or be where you are. So they're relentless in their pursuit. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. The rest of us have other thoughts. Do our guests have any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Hey, Ryan. No. <laughs> All right. They're ignoring me. Yes? There's, there's really no indication that she was really even a temptation to him. She she was trying to make herself a temptation to him, but mm. just because she was offering it doesn't mean he was really interested. He so knew, she, but he knew either way it was wrong, you know. So he he said he'd try to stay out of the way. You think she was unattractive? No, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Does you matter. think that just because he's a man, he's automatically tempted? <laughs> 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 I, mean, right. I know I like a happy ending, so it drives me nuts that he was doing the right thing and he still ends up in jail, except I realize even as the controller of the whole household and, and those other people who should have been in the house who could have been eyewitnesses and could have you know stood up for him or been there so that she wouldn't have tried what she did. Mm -hmm. However, God's sovereign plan was that he was going to have a purpose in jail. Right. So you can't thwart the plan that the Lord had, even though there's a part of all of us that wants justice, and she was the one then the wrong. Yeah. So that's hard for us. In our own life, we want to do the right thing and be rewarded, and that doesn't always happen. Sometimes we live in the moment. We don't say, okay, this person will get what's for them. We want revenge. We want well, justice. But we want the person who's done the wrong to stop for one and then they do the wrong to be punished because that seems like the just thing any other thoughts before we move on so she was in his face on a daily basis that's what the scripture says she spoke to joseph day after day that must be hard because well the world has kind of changed and there's this thing called me too i'm not trying to be political here but <laughs> daily that's like, okay, I can't escape this. She is the one with the power. At least she represents in some way the power. Her husband is indeed chief of the guard and Joseph is the slave. So in the case of going to court, his word would not have a lot of weight. And he is also a Hebrew. He's also a foreigner. So the odds are stacked against him in this situation. So she waits till he is alone with her or there's no one else in the house and she traps him here. Okay. I'm going to skip question number seven. Question number eight. Joseph was a victim of his brother's evil desires and now he's a victim of Mrs. Potiphar. Okay, I didn't know her first name. So just her. Mrs. Potiphar's desires. Do we see similarities in how he acted in both of these situations? I can hear Carol in my head right now. The scripture doesn't tell us. <laughs> well, I'm saying I think she, he probably did not go to her and tell him of a dream he had twice <laughs> of how he was going to rule over them. Mm -hmm. So th there was a little difference there. But is that what you, is that what you heard me saying? <laughs> no, <I'm not>. <laughs> <laughs> the scripture doesn't tell us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm having way too much fun, aren't I? <laughs> any other thoughts? Do, any similarities in how he acted in these situations? Well, when he was sold, he didn't have a choice. Okay. I mean, no. Well, if he would have resisted, they probably would have killed him. And he was a kid. And when he was in the well, nobody recorded what he said and no one heard. You know, the tree falling in the forest mm -hmm. doesn't make a sound. So we don't know. 
we don't know whether or not to try to defend himself with yeah, the, the codify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except I am going to be a little bit lenient with Mr. Potiphar in a minute. Because Mr. Potiphar saw that the Lord had blessed him, and how did it begin? The Lord was with him. Right. So if Mr. Potiphar sees that the Lord is with him, and the wife comes up with a tail. Yeah, but we don't know how the wife was acting to Mr. Potiphar either when she told the story. Yeah, some scholars say that when you were a high official in the Egyptian army situation, sometimes <laughs> you have to become a unit to make sure that you don't end up doing certain things and maybe he was made a unit. And I just heard that or read that somewhere. So again, a little bit of speculation. I, just a messenger, okay? I didn't make it up. We don't know what the other stories were. That's what I wanted. Was this a pattern? Was she a pattern? Was she a pattern? Well, this was something she did. If you're well-built and handsome. Right, right. I don't know. All right, let's there were no <laughs> helpers in the room or in the house that day. She obviously had sent them out and she was lessons. setting him up. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. We might mess with the word. Yeah. Now let's keep going. That's the reason I'm asking when you're trying to figure out whether a person's telling the truth or not. You ask them several questions. Mm -hmm. You go in a sequence of questions and ultimately get the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number nine. Wake him up. <laughs> right, question number nine, verses 13 through 18. Then she saw he left his cloak in her hand. Question number nine. The actions of Potiphar's wife included enticement, physical force, <laughs> and lying. What lessons can we learn <laughs> from her actions? <laughs> Uh, years ago, um, y'all know my well, most of you know my family, and and John was our oldest was the rebellious kid, and Stephen was not. He was a good kid. I'm sure he did some things that I didn't know about. Never want to know. But one night he got living with me, and it was we'd come home from night meeting, and everybody was tired, and and. I, I, he said something, I said something, and he took off up the front door, and I went after him, and I grabbed his jacket, his very favorite, what he had saved money for, was his jacket, and he left me with his jacket, <laughs> so I kind of understand what Mrs. Potiphar might have been going through, he grabbed the jacket for her cloak, and he got him, and he opened it, and he said, oh, I'm it gave her an opportunity to make a case. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though it was a false one, yeah. it sounded true. Sure. Mm -hmm. But she could have she could have gotten this cloak some other way. Had another servant steal her. So it seemed as though she felt there's nobody else around. This is the ideal circumstance. Well, I I, I agree with her that she said that. Yeah. They never were alone. They always had people. Everything was. And now, when she's trying to build her case, she's bringing all the rest of the servants in that, right. that he's making sport of us. She's mm -hmm. using different uh -huh. plural mm -hmm. pronouns now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, question number 10 is where I decided to be a little, I got into part of his head and decided to think, well, if indeed he sees that the Lord, verse 3, his master part of us saw the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in part of our service. Question number 10. Even though punishments in ancient Egypt were notoriously cruel, including death for sexual assault, verse 19 says when Potiphar heard his wife's story, he had Joseph put in prison. Not death, he's a slave after all, of course. He had him put in prison. So here's where I'm starting to think, well, Potiphar probably knows his wife and he lived with her all these years. <laughs> I'm thinking that he is not 100% convinced by her story. Even though, again, I don't want to revise scripture. It says that he burned with anger, but he didn't send him to the gallows. He didn't have him executed or anything like that. He sent him off to prison. Maybe he burned with 
anger about her, how she set him up. Think about it, but and maybe he was mad because this is his right hand person. Now, what do I do? And he had to do something because she okay. might seem like he's seen as weak. Mm -hmm. So, had him put, yeah, you're the captain of a guard and you let this Hebrew slave get away with here. it, right? So, I suspect he gave him a lesser punishment than otherwise would have been the case or would have been his right. To admit punishment that you normally expect. Mm -hmm. And he didn't ask him his side of the story. But again, <laughs> he is a slave. But in both cases, his, a cloak, like his, one of his clothes took him down, right? Mm -hmm. And in neither case was he killed. His brothers could have killed him. That's what they're saying. Right. Yeah. And now this there. guy could have done the same thing. In both cases, they imprisoned him. You know? Love that. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. Love that. And, and how far was Hope when I remember she pronounced it? Um, knew how knew how God was blessing Joseph, and um, he he. He, he, he might have been afraid. Yes, that's what I was trying to get out. He might have been afraid to go against Joseph and God. I mean, he knew who God was. He obviously knew who God was. And 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 he knew that the Lord was with Joseph. He knew that that I wouldn't want to go against God if I knew all of that. Can I say out of character? Yeah. I have a commentary here on that. It said it like. The reason why Joseph was not killed is likely indicated his respect for Joseph's integrity, as well as the sad condition of Potiphar's own marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if he knew his wife's character deficiencies, Potiphar could hardly accept her report at face value. He may have wanted time to investigate his wife's allegations while jailing Joseph to see her face. Mm -hmm. He could talk to all those other servants. Why wouldn't you in the house? Yes. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, that Potiphar's wife was jealous that his relationship with, with with Joseph was such a good relationship, and that he knew he how smart he was and how intelligent that that she was jealous. Can you think of another situation where a leader was sympathetic towards someone accused? And hoped. I'm thinking Babylon. Oh, yeah, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. praying that, the, that Daniel's God would save him from this terrible situation. I was un uncomfortable with what I was saying, but Ellen, your Bible just nailed it. In such a way. There's a situation here. I think Potiphar is thinking because we are seeming to suggest the wife's reputation or attitude is not unknown to him. And therefore, when this accusation comes, Joseph, really? Okay, uh, Joseph, you just go and sit in the king's prison. Any other thoughts? We have a oh, we're getting a bit of time here. But it does say his anger was kindled. Yes. That's. Well, it's also embarrassing. Yes. All right. No more speculating. <laughs> Back to the handout. Question number 11. According to verse 21, what was consistent when Joseph was a slave as well as a prisoner? Verse 21. Lord was with him. Not only that, but he trusted the Lord. We need to stop here and do a little reflecting. Sometimes, I think I read the song, crosses come and it costs us dearly. And if you know that the Lord is with you, 
you might start to wonder, but Lord, uh, if you're with me, why is the sky falling? But you have to get perspective. As was mentioned, the long haul. The middle is not the end. And sometimes we overreact in the middle of the process. I'm guilty occasionally anticipating the outcome before it actually is supposed to happen. And when you look back, you say, why did I even bother about that or take that on the way I did? Why did I handle it the way I did? Getting angry, for example, with someone significant in your life. Knowing that in the long run, you're going to have this as a mild hiccup in your relationship. I think sometimes we get, our feelings get the better of us. And the words of Gowans in that song, you just need to make sure that the situation doesn't overwhelm you. This human nature is a terrible thing at times. Mm -hmm. It causes us to say and do things that we should not, we know better. Could it be that we know the middle better than, better than we know the end? Because we are going through the middle right now. Okay. Yeah. We live in the moment. Yeah. So someone put a bow on this thing for me right now. A thought. I was coming to it again. Go ahead. You say as a prisoner and slave, Joseph could have seen his situation as hopeless. Instead, he did his best with each small task given him. His diligence and positive attitude were soon noticed by the warden who promoted him to prison administrator. Are you facing a seemingly hopeless predicament at work, at home, or at school? Follow Joseph's example by taking each small task and doing your best. Remember how God turned Joseph's situation around. He will see you, your effort, and can reverse even his overwhelming odds. Can we get an amen to it? Amen. <laughs> so God would serve. Any other wisdom? Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> Question number 12. Well, I think Samuel has already <laughs> answered that question in his commentary. What counsel would you give to someone in Joseph's shoes where temptation presents itself daily? Let's hear the wisdom of our many years. What counsel would you give to someone in Joseph's shoes? Um, so often when things are coming at us, we don't have the It's the presence of God. Sin, sin is not the ab no salvation is not the absence of sin. Okay. It's the presence of God. Good save. Older than you were yesterday. But it's God. somewhere in your answer. I want to reflect on the fact that we need aids or tools. To help us in these circumstances. You can't just say it's going to happen in the moment. You got to say, okay, I need some help. I need something to guide me, to help me, to keep me focused, to keep me. You know, I, I think if if we went through some scenarios, Weight Watchers has been a, a great help to me in many things, not only with weight and, but in life. And the practice of saying no when somebody offers you that that dessert that Janet Hamilton made. <laughs> <laughs> so, so oh, it's so good. It's got graham crackers and cups there. Oh, yeah, that and one. And chocolate. <laughs> and then some whipped cream. Oh. oh. <laughs> you have to think about that and look in the mirror and say, no, thank you. In the nicest <laughs> way possible. No, thank you. But I think we need, as Christians, we need to practice some of these things 
So to become more of <coughs> something that we do automatically when the bad times come. And I can tell you that I didn't learn that lesson growing up. I don't know why. It, I'm sure it was presented, but I didn't, it didn't sink in. But the more you practice, the more you do this, the more something happens and you immediately go to God or you immediately go to scripture or you find uh, a Bible study book that, that had a truth in it that you grabbed onto. And some of the Bible study books that we're using in women's ministry have attributes of God in the back. And those have been so helpful to me. And um, but we, we need to practice going immediately to God, even if you have to make up a scenario and practice the solution. It will help you when the real times come. Can I be not unscriptural or unbiblical, but we also need to have other people okay. accountable. Okay. But but I don't go to other people when I'm doing something. Right. Like but come on. <laughs> okay, say that one more time. <laughs> yeah, so Nancy, when, when, when I'm being tempted, I'm going to get after her. <laughs> when I'm sitting next to her in a meal. <laughs> but what about accountability? If somebody, if you tell someone, I mean, I don't mean to sound better than anybody else, but when I first met my wife, I pretty much told her, I said, there's some things that will never happen will never happen. You can take that to the bank, it will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> the, point, the point was by getting out there ahead of anything and announcing this, mm -hmm. I'm gonna make myself look really bad if I don't stick to this. It's kind of like any contractual or covenantal thing you make. A lot of covenants we make be great, but you know, you just say, oh, this will never happen. I promise you that this will never happen. Just by saying it makes me feel accountable. Mm -hmm. I've gone out there and said it, and I've told 25 people. Right. So you go ahead and hold me accountable. We need accountability. So that when we are alone with our thoughts and our in the darkness, we don't give in. Because we say, you know what? What if these people who I said this to find out that I'm a hypocrite? Well, they might know that already, but <laughs> you don't want to make it. But, but you had already set that boundary and perhaps even practice saying it before it came out of your mouth. Right there, yeah. right there. So you see so many people in life that when they uh, think they've got you, they jump on and say, well, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You know? That's not the way you're approaching. You were in my court one, weren't you? That was great. I deserve that. Yes. Uh, okay, Alan has the floor. I'm not going to speak again. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about. Um, <laughs> well, when I make a promise to somebody and, and I promise out loud that I'm going to do something, I feel so obligated to do it mm -hmm. that if I didn't do it, I beat myself over the head. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I think when you say, I hate the word never because you know, I'm no. not perfect and I might slip somehow, somewhere, sometime because um, I can say never for today. But I can't say never because the set of circumstances might change and yeah, we don't we don't know. But I think if you, you make a promise to someone and you say it out loud, you have to follow up. We make that promise to God. Even though we know that sin is lurking, we say that. The song I just read said, I'll not go back. If crosses come, I'll not go back. No matter what it would cost. So and sometimes we slip. Thankfully, God is gracious. So there's more than as good as some of the people here, but I have made promises and gone back on them. I have said things, I will never, I will always, and done exactly the opposite. And my mind goes back to Paul 
who says, the things I want to do, I don't do. Oh, wretched man. Oh, wretched woman that I am. But, but uh, once again, though, learning from those experiences and practicing when I'm by myself, practice looking in the mirror and saying, how not to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have a minute, I'll just share uh, something. Uh, born and raised in the Army, became a senior soldier, a junior soldier, then a senior soldier, and did all the things. And my husband passed away. And I was, I, I, I said to myself, I'm going to take every opportunity I can to do something different, to change the routine of my life. And one of the things was I got to go on a trip um, to, to Italy and other places. And, and it, was, it was beautiful. But while I was on the trip, people were, I was with Methodists, you know, and they drink some of them these days. <laughs> and, and they would order a carafe of wine and say, no, we're going to And I'm thinking I'm in Italy. And so, I, yeah, I had a glass or two, and God called me on it. Have you ever had God call yes. you on yeah. something? I mean, I, I promised not to have alcoholic beverage. Well. And, um, <laughs> and he actually called me out. You made a vow to me about this, Carol, and I haven't had a glass of wine or anything since. You know, we are free will agents, but I had made a vow, even when... And I tried the excuse. I was only 14 when I did my life. You know? Oh, when you made the promise. When I made the promise. When the Romans do. Yeah. Um, but, but he called me on it. And I'm grateful he did. Because that strengthens me for other vows. Yeah. We're the, the two minute warning. All right. I'm going to question number 15. How should we handle it when we are punished for doing the right thing? Well, that's the thing. Joseph was faced with more than one temptation. He had the dream early on. He knew that his life had a purpose. And there was also a temptation for him to feel as though God may have forgotten him or that he wasn't amounting to what he had originally been it had been shared with him. Pause for a so second. Instead, Pause for a second. Listen to what she's saying. <laughs> now I can't say it. <laughs> no, but but he he could have spent time when he was sold into slavery. He could have spent time in prison. All of those could have made him feel as though he didn't get it right earlier. God really didn't have a purpose. Mm -hmm. But he didn't lose focus. No matter where he was, he knew that he was meant to live for God. And he followed the disciplines that he had learned. He glorified God no matter where he was. So there were more temptations than just about his life. First Peter yeah. 4, 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Commit ourselves to doing good. The one I mentioned in question number 15, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 4, 19. Okay, so we have seconds to go. Question for reflection. Am I prepared to respond to unkindness and betrayal with forgiveness? It's not easy, but we have to tell ourselves, you know, people will be unkind. People will betray us. What is our response? In the moment, we want to say and do certain I things. Have to, it has to be a certain amount of time for me because mm -hmm. I have to think things over mm -hmm. and I don't want to say things in the moment. Mm -hmm. So um, it's your first reaction could be a, a negative one. Mm -hmm. So I like to think about it before I respond. I don't want to give in to that first emotion. Last call, last thought, closing thought. It was uh, Oleika, Potiphar's wife, got punished for what for lies about Joseph? Does she? Oh, I don't think it says. Carol would say scripture doesn't tell us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pause, reflect, and let's close the note with prayer. Heavenly Father, 
help us to understand that this lesson is designed so we can reflect on our own circumstances, our own behavior, our thought patterns, that we can be a beacon for others, that we can also be a source for others who need help. I pray that you will give us the wisdom so that in our own counsel of others, we can show them that one does not have to yield to temptation. One doesn't have to give in to circumstances. The scripture gives us good guidance on how we ought to restrain ourselves and bridle our tongue and just let you fight our battles for us. So we thank you for this assurance. Help us to be confident that you will see us through, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the crosses that come. May we put this in our hearts today, and may we do our best to be pleasing in the way we live our lives, not only today, but each and every day. In Jesus' name.